Hey, we're looking at cybersecurity now, which is all about protecting networks, computers, and programs slash data from attack, damage, or unauthorized access. So we're going to be firstly looking at some security threats, then we're going to be looking at some measures to lessen the threats. As I say, let's firstly look at threats, and malware is an umbrella term for any hostile or intrusive software, so definitely a threat to a system. And um, there's a few main types we're looking at. So first of all, let's talk about viruses. And what these do, they insert themselves, as in their code gets inserted in normal program code, so that when the host program, the program that has now got this virus inside it, gets executed, so does the virus code. So it, it becomes embedded in your host program. In the same way that when you get sick, a virus is actually inside your body your, your cells in your body. Um, a second main type is adware, which I'm sure you've come across to some extent. This automatically renders or generates unwanted adverts in order to make money for whoever started the attack, the instigator. And as when I say you come across it, you come across annoying pop-ups and stuff that are unclosable, and they might link to other types of malware. So adware can often be kind of like a gateway to other types of malware. The next are trojans, which share the name from the Trojan horse in the Greek story which you've probably heard of and like that they are kind of disguised software so they're installed on a computer disguised as normal software, software you actually want but actually at a certain point in time, so maybe a week after you install it or at a predetermined time the malware hidden within it will activate and take over this previously uh, desirable software. The final type we'll look at, this isn't a complete list, these are just the ones the exam board want you to know. Uh, spyware collects data about the activities on the computer and then sends it back to whoever started the attack. So it might log all the presses on the keyboard in order to record passwords and so on. And of course these can all be protected against by using up-to-date anti-malware software, which I'm only saying that because the exam board will be very keen for you to say something along those lines. So on a similar theme of appealing to the examiner, let's talk about some other security threats which aren't totally related to malware. So first of all, having unpatched software. So unpatched software is a software that's got an issue, it's got a security hole in it, that has been fixed in a later release, a newer release, but that you haven't actually installed. So unpatched software is just normal software that's got an issue, it's got maybe um, a bug in it, and the developers released an update but you haven't installed it, so you're at risk to whatever the security hole is in this unpatched software. Similarly, but slightly differently, we have outdated software. So unpatched software is outdated because it's got a new release that fixes it, but outdated software doesn't necessarily have a security hole. I'm now talking more about anti-malware software. So I said that it's important to have up-to-date anti-malware software. This is because they'll have a, the software will have a database of the latest malware, you know, the signs it needs to look for, and obviously this changes constantly because developers are developing more malware so they need to update constantly in order to have a full protection. But if you have outdated anti-malware software, say from five years ago, it's not going to be much good for you. A third potential threat is misconfigured access rights. And access access rights are all about permissions, so basic user administrator. People have certain permissions to do certain things. So if you've got a student account at your school, you won't be able to access everything the teachers are, for example. And so an issue might come where a student accidentally is given the teacher's access rights and they can go look at the register or some, some issue and obviously more serious than that. But that's the whole idea of misconfigured access rights. Finally we have malicious code which is a huge category which we won't fully explore because we don't need to. But this is any code that does something malicious so modifies, deletes, steals data and so on. That's probably from a free main. And obviously malware falls under this category because it's code, it's a program, but also things like SQL injection attacks are a form of malicious code. This is where you try and directly query a database through a web in interface, which you don't need to know too much about, but you may have heard of. Backdoors in programs is where there's some code that allows someone else to um, interact with a program. So the NSA in America um, would write backdoors into software and encryption so they could access it at a later date. Similarly, a logic bomb is is more like a um, something that triggers after a certain amount of time. So this is some code that's written that will kick in a certain amount of time. So for example, if someone's interning at a company for four months, they might write some code in that time that will activate in five months' time after they've left if it does something malicious. And those are the main ones I can think of, but generally uh, malicious code is relatively self-explanatory. Let's now look at a topic outside of computer science that is brought in to this topic, and this is social engineering. And this is for uh, manipulation of people to give up confidential information. 
And as I said, this is important because people, humans, are often the weak points in a system. You could have the best security system of the world, but if an employee gives someone their password in a phishing email, then that scuppers the whole system. We're going to look at four subcategories of social engineering. The first one being blagging, and this is inventing a scenario to engage a victim and gain their trust. So this could be honestly anything. This could be you know, the famous Nigerian prince emails trying to get you to send them money. This could be pretending to be a bank or pretending you're a new employee of a company. This could be, I mean, you can, you've can you probably got better imagination than I do, but just inventing something in order to gain trust. That's the whole idea of social engineering, to be fair. The second one is phishing, which I mentioned a second ago. This is a, a very similar to blagging where you get private information through an external link. So you might get an email that looks like it's come from your school, looks like it's come from your work, and actually it's a fake. It's trying to blag in some way, and it will link to some other place which might have some malware there as well. Farming is a cyber attack where a website's traffic is redirected to a fake site. So when you try and go on a website, it directs you to a fake site by mistake. Well, not not by mistake, deliberately. And um, there's a few ways you can do this without going into too much detail. You can change. A reason we can't go into too much detail because it's not actually on your course, but things like changing the domain um, name settings in your router, perhaps. There are, there are various ways you can do this, but the effect is you go to a fake site instead of the real one. And finally, we have shouldering, which is viewing private information over a person's shoulder, or just viewing it in general. It doesn't have to be that shady, but the point is you're literally seeing someone's PIN number or password or some other information. So it's much more, this is much more real life than the other methods, which are all online.